allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. louder if I turn the mic on. Our meeting is being recorded and televised by the local cable company. We'll begin the meeting with a moment of silence. And during that time, we might want to keep in our, uh, our thoughts and prayers Lenny Baker, Nancy Reagan, and Ashley Gindon, the police person who uh, fell on her first day of duty down in Virginia. Like a motion to approve fill and payroll warrants? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Like a motion to accept correspondence in the read file? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public forum, is there anyone here who would like to speak on something that's not on the agenda? Okay. It's almost 7.05, so. We will we will wait for thirty seconds and we'll be fine. Uh, it's time to open a public uh, public hearing with respect to the application of South Avenue Trust LLC doing business as Tracy E Lodging for a rooming house license on the premises located at one forty six South Avenue take action at the same time to rescind the rooming house license for J.L. Forrester Property Management LLC doing business as Tracy E. Lodging, Robert D. Wright on the premises located at 146 Avenue, South Avenue. Frank, do you want to explain what this is about? Yes, this is a, uh, this was uh, originally the nursing home up the street here mm -hmm. that became a lodge about 12, 13 years ago. It's been under a single ownership and ownership is transferred uh, to the current applicant, who I believe is present, and um, they are simply taking over. They're not anticipating any changes to the facility, and uh, in order for them to do so, we need to issue a license. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a second. Second. Does anyone have any comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Monthly reports, police and fire. Deputy Chief. Can you get, can you get it? Yeah. We have the report. Yes, sir. So, I, so you, since we have the report, your remarks don't have to be, you know, really extensive. You can point out the highlights, and if anyone has questions, they can, they can ask you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, Chief Benton forwarded you this earlier, so. Right. The uh, log calls from January 1st um, through the end of February, uh, are, they're up 538 log calls uh, from the same time last year. As of the end of February, there's 17 ar uh, arrests and 33 criminal applications. The drug overdoses are at two through the end of February. We did have a, uh, a recent one that's being investigated, whether it was an actual overdose. Uh, or something other. I uh, wanted to remind everyone that the Whitman Hanson Will is hosting a town hall meeting at the Whitman Hanson High School John F. McEwen Performing Arts Center on March 15, 2016 from 6.30 to 8.30. Taylor's story, Kathy Sullivan, this will be prevented to all high school students and there will be a panel discussion following the presentation. Uh, right, and if I could, if somehow the, the cameraman could zero in on this this is a flyer for that event the event is called if i only knew and it's actually what we're hoping is that uh 
we can encourage uh, parents or people who know people who have had trouble with uh, drugs and alcohol, alcohol to come to this evening meeting from 6.30 to 8.30. Yeah, and that title is very fitting because... Um, if I only know. We, we don't always know, and right. it, it's, it hits us from behind. And We've had a, as you all know, if, who have um, been listening to um, the chief and myself over the last few months, uh, we have a coalition uh, called Whitman Will that deals with this issue, and the school system has been terrific in its um, uh, interest in this and its, and its uh, excitement about it, um, especially uh, especially Athletic Director Rogers, who's, who's has been remarkable on, on this whole issue, and uh, he's been stressing it and mm -hmm. what he does with his athletes. To this date, though, we have not been able to encourage um, much parent support, and in the other in the other towns that have um, are involved in the coalition too, Rockland and East Bridgewater, most of their meetings um, are populated by parents and people who know other people who have had trouble with trouble with drugs. At Whitman, we've had a, a great high school <coughs> great high school cooperation and participation, but some for some reason we have not been able through our publicity to encourage parents to get involved. Um, it would be really good if they used this opportunity on March 15th to 6:30 to, uh, to to do so. The kids are going to are going to have some activities during the day that deal with this issue, um, and they've had activities during the day before. I think the evening's presentation um, is going to is devoted as much to parents as it is to the, as it is to the uh, to the young adults. Um, on the panel is uh, a woman by the name of Stacy. Stacy Lynch, and she's from the um, Adolescent Treatment Center at High Point called the Castle. Chief Benton is going to be a speaker at the, at the panel. Correct. Um, Officer Bill Frazier from Hanson is going to be a, a speaker at the panel. Uh, for parent support, Joanne Peterson, who most people know, who is the founder and the CEO of Learn to Cope, is going to be there, um, as well as a uh, young adult in recovery, Mary Cunningham, and they'll, perform, they'll be on the panel. And uh, it, stands to be a pretty important and interesting occasion and evening and so thank you for bringing it up i would like to encourage people to go to if only i knew whitman hansen will has also come out with a little fly a little card that uh, they're going to be passing around It'll, and there'll be some of them available at this meeting and it's just a simple little card that provides primary secondary and tertiary substance use prevention uh, resources to the community. It, it lists the resources. And I'll just read them quickly. Uh, Whitman Hanson Will, which has its own um, website, WhitmanHansonWill.org. The Castle, as I mentioned before, the Adolescent Treatment Center over at, uh, at High Point. Independence Academy, um, which is the um, academy in Brockton, the high school for people who are um, trying to recover from substance abuse. Uh, Learn to Cope organization, which I mentioned, the Whitman Counseling Center in Whitman, the East Bridgewater Hope Drop-In Center, which on the first and third, third Thursdays um, encourages people to drop in if they want to talk about these kinds of issues, parents and uh, friends and uh, people who are in trouble alike. And also the Holy Ghost Parish on the first Saturday of the month um, offers its resources to deal with this, um, the crisis that... Uh, and on the back of this crisis, it, is, uh, it caused uh, four people, as you've heard the governor say over and over again, four people a day die of overdoses in Massachusetts. Four people a day. Yeah. If you were to, I remember this, a statistic from a couple of years ago, if you were to take the number of men and women from Massachusetts who went to Iraq and Afghanistan over a five-year period, I think it was perhaps 2001 or 2002 to 2007, if you take the number of Massachusetts men and women who died in Afghanistan and Iraq in that period of time uh, and multiplied it by 42, you would have the number of people who have died of overdose. It's not a recent event. This overdose epidemic is not a recent event, something that's been going on for quite a long time. Um, and we're starting, to, uh, we're starting to catch up with it. On the back of this little card are the numbers for the Whitman Police, Whitman Fire, Hanson Police, Hanson Fire the high school, the high school guidance department, Hanson Middle School and Whitman Middle School. And it's, um, it, uh, people are making an effort and hopefully it will um, have some results, but thanks for mentioning that tonight. Chief has been really good about keeping people on board. 
on this. And uh, this is our last opportunity before March 15th to uh, right. talk about it on air. And I just wanted to say, say a few things. There's a sign out front that everybody can look at that, that shows that it's that's going on. Uh, and um, hopefully people will, will show up. The one problem with the, Mar with the March 15th date is that if the Whitman Hanson boys basketball team wins their next two games, they'll be playing in the state tournament final, I believe, on that night in Boston or someplace else. So there's a possibility that there'll be some schedule. It'll be hard for some people to come to an event like this if the boys are playing in a big basketball game. Right. But that's out there. We're not wishing for the boys to, to lose <laughs> in order to have a bigger crowd. No. But we'd like to encourage a, a crowd. <laughs> Uh, we'd, we'd encourage everybody to attend because um, it may not affect you directly, but you're going to know somebody, a friend, family, somewhere along the line. It's going to it's going to hit home. Yeah. yeah. Um, if not your family everybody. directly, then someone you know. So at least to stay informed, if nothing else, you know what's going on out there. And you want to remind us of the mock crash on the same day? I'd like to. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's March 15th at the high school. Uh, I believe it's in the morning. I don't have a time. <laughs> Um, and we met with uh, Pat Dillon from uh, Whitman Hanson School Security and Chief Greno from the Fire Department and went over crisis plans for the schools and that's an ongoing process. We, we try and review all that, uh, make sure we're up to date, any changes we could make uh, for the better. Um, so we're, we're on top of that, trying to keep everyone as safe as possible. And uh, with that last storm, the wind storm and rain, we did have um, part of the fencing blew down at the police station mm -hmm. based on the force flows. of the uh, force of the winds. So we had to get that repaired. Okay. No, we shouldn't have put that fence. Does anyone have any questions of Deputy Chief? Is that fencing covered by insurance? Plan? I don't think the cost was that great. Scott went ahead and repaired it. Um, we have a thousand dollar deductible. I don't know what it costs. The apparently the ties separated from the uh, posts. I don't know exactly what was involved in the repair. I don't know. Uh, it was, it was really just propping it up on that side yeah. in the back. Um, the winds must have been heading in a northerly direction because it was only the back section of the fence. Yeah, I mean, and that's all wind. Yeah, that was all wind damage, and then a tree fell wind. down on the other mm -hmm. side, and that. We think pulled some of the posts from uh, being plumbed, so that had to be yeah. squared is, up. Again. Is it still in this condition? No, no, it's been it's been fixed. All right, so no, no he called me, told me he was no. repairing it that okay. weekend. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chief also wanted to like to thank the men and women of the Whitman Police Department and the Auxiliary Force for their dedication and commitment to public safety and the citizens of Whitman. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, and I, I, what I appreciate the, uh, we had asked him um, before, in previous uh, reports, he would give us uh, a little, not a rundown, but he'd give us a report on the increase in log calls from last year to this year and all that, and I asked him if we could have some more detail on that, and he supplied that, um, three or four pages of pretty interesting statistics, uh, call action breakdown, case assignment breakdown, man hours by call arrived to clear, call reason breakdown. And um, thank him for um, putting together those those stats. I'll do that. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, Chief, you're up. Good evening. Good job. Forward everybody the report um, last Friday, or last Thursday rather, uh, under the orders of Biz O'Brien. <laughs> you don't have it in by time we get. Cash marks. She's good. She is. Um, just a brief overview. But um, first off, is there any questions on the report that I submitted? Does anybody have any questions or concerns on that? Just a brief overview. We did switch over to the regional dispatch center. Um, it's been just about a month now, and things have been moving extremely uh, well. Um, we've had several significant events where it it would have taxed um, our services out um, immensely, and the regional center was able to. Um, perform basically without a hitch. Um, 
things 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 are very good there. Um, call volume in February was at 241 emergency responses, as noted. That's actually down from where we were last year by 86 runs, but the decrease in the runs is directly associated to the last February that we had last year and the snowstorms that we had. Mm -hmm. It was mainly because of wire down calls and stuff like that. So run for one, run for run, we're pretty much on track. In fact, um, EMS responses are a little bit higher for the month of February than what we had um, in the previous February. 48.5% um, of what we're doing right now is EMS calls or um, rescue calls. Um, residential properties still makes up the most of our responses at 56 um, pr um, percent of our calls. Um, and the south side of town still takes the majority of our services. 60.6 percent of our calls are on the south side of town. So Dr. Kowalski is safe. Dan is tax note to services. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, we take care of things on the east side. Yeah. Uh, in the busiest times, on, uh, on I noticed on Fridays between 3 and 4 for emergency responses. Yeah. No rhyme or reason, just like Mondays in the emergency rooms. Mondays are always busy in the summertime in the emergency rooms because nobody wants to go to the doctor's office or, or the ER on Sundays. They'd rather take a sick day on Monday and go to the ER then. Ah, okay. <laughs> we see an increase in ambulance transports on Mondays also. Um, I would also like to comment um, briefly on the March 15th date mm -hmm. with Operation Safe Prom. Um, our department has um, been working closely with um, the police department and like Officer uh, Frazier. And, you know, we started Operation Safe Prom back in the 90s. Um, and, what op and, and, and what Operation Safe Prom is, is pretty much a mock car crash that shows the students the effects of drunk driving. And this year, they're adding the twist of of uh, of, um, op of of opioid um, like addiction and what that can do and how that causes um, like car crash and stuff. So it should be a very um, interesting morning and pretty much a full day at the high school for the kids to learn and hopefully the parents too will to come and see what um, the effects are of uh, what this um, like addiction is. Okay. Um, the budget is in pretty good shape right now, except for expense. We're we're pacing exceptionally well with all other services, um, which is the like, salary line. Expense, you see in my report, we've been riddled with breakdowns for whatever reason this year. It's just taxing us out something we could. In fact, I I just put Engine 2 um, back in service um, this afternoon. Um, that was down for, for, for a week and a half. Ladder 1 probably has $3,500 worth of damage done to that. It's of no rhyme or reason. Um, it's what we call the waterway on it, which is the pipe that goes up the entire ladder truck that shoots water out. It's a, it's what we call um, pre-piped. The truck is 11 years old. It's light, it's light metal. F from all that we can gather is that because of a lot of the road conditions in town and the bouncing around, that that light metal just broke and it lost 90% of the mechanisms to go that's somewhere on the streets. So we're getting through it. We're working with it. Um, I'd also like to thank the members of uh, the fire department. They've uh, been working exceptionally well. Um, we've been very, very busy. Um, there's been a lot of like going on. Um, through that cold snap, we had a couple small fires in town. We had one fire that it cost it's about a $5,500 claim, which was because of uh, heat tape on people's water pipes, which never really made sense to me is why you wrap a pipe with an electrical cord to like, keep it warm. Um, and what happens with heat tape Mm. Over the years, it dries and it cracks and it corrodes, and that fire. leads to fire. Mm -hmm. So that was one of them. And we also sent an engine to Weymouth um, on that night that it was about 10 below zero out. They had three multiple alarm fires going on at the same time, and we sent an engine over there also. So it's been busy. Okay. That's what I have. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Chief, thank you. Thank you. Good report. Next item on the agenda is to take action to renew the following taxi livery licenses and taxi livery driver certificates for the period April 1, 2016 through March 31, 2017, subject to payment of the license fees and the submittal of all required renewal documents. And therefore, Eric Young, doing business as Sleep Near Transportation, 8 Danica Drive, and Keith A. Gutierrez, doing business as Ace Transporter, 100 Linden Street, number 2. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. There's a second. Any questions or discussion? Uh, yeah. The, uh, the one that's on Denica Drive, that's in a residential area, the person who is doing that, if they, they're parking their vehicle there, they need, if there's any uh, writing on the car, it has to be taken off, I believe. Right, Frank? I think that's what the 
you were saying before that they have to take off the metal the decals. Decals. Yeah. You can't have commercial vehicles parked in the residential area. Is that correct, Bob? Just want to make sure that's happening, especially that area. On both streets, actually. Um, the way the zoning reads is that you can run a business from a single family home. However, you cannot have any outdoor storage. So if they were to park it in the garage, there would be no issue. Or if they had a, a vehicle that did not look like a commercial vehicle and they took off the lettering uh, when they parked it, that would be okay. fine. Um, I haven't received any complaints nor any questions regarding this property in the yeah. past. Okay. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Consider the request of Myers and Harrington LLP to increase the rate for legal services. Frank? Yes. Uh, although Murphy, Lamory, and Murphy is our primary counsel and handles most of our legal needs, uh, when we get into environmental law, we typically go to a environmental law firm that has expertise. Uh, we used to use Gas Hanna, but it's 600 bucks an hour. Uh, we stopped using them many years ago. And of late, we've had a couple of uh, instances to use Myers and Harrington, and they're a reasonable firm that provides the services we need, and I don't think the request is out of line. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? Yeah, I'd like to know, do you anticipate anything? Well, they're is working there? with us right now on, on the... Uh, Regal property, mass development is providing the funding. Um, they have obtained the court orders for us to actually enter the property and place the wells and um, have done a good job with relatively uh, limited expense. I think we're up around 1500 now, maybe, in total. So uh, yeah, we got a ways to go with that project. Too. Yeah, we don't. Well, things are actually looking a little more encouraging right now um, that is an ideal property for some type of supermarket or retail entity right next to the tracks and once we've identified what the potential cost for remediation is that can be part of the plan to market the property to a company willing to come in complete that work and make it a productive property Good. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and, and this just in, you know, the power of instant communication. Uh, Kevin Tachi, who works for, uh, uh, among other things, uh, the Whitman Hanson Cable Company, um, has let me know that they will be taping the mock car crash and the Whitman Will event on 315. The f flyer that I held up during the meeting is up on the station's community bulletin board, on the community bulletin board of Cape. So just to let you know that the publicity uh, machine <laughs> is working. <laughs> and thank you very much, Kevin, for letting me know in such an um, efficient fashion. It's good to know we have a live audience. <laughs> good to know there's one person out there that's, 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 that's looking at what's going on. That's right. And he's not, afraid, and he's not afraid to let us know. That's good. No, it, it, seriously. Why are Thank you going to make fun of him tonight? No, I'm not, not making fun of Kevin. <laughs> Kevin's my man. Um, next item on the agenda is the distribution of the liquor license violation policy for review and action on March 22nd. And you have you have on your desk the uh, a draft rules and regulations and enforcement policy for the licensing of alcoholic beverage sales in the town of Whitman. Um, Greg uh, did a lot of work on this, and, and Frank uh, got involved as, in, as well in researching what other towns do as far as rules and regulations and enforcement policies for the licensing of alcoholic beverages sales. I had asked them to, to, uh, to research that um, uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago. And we're going to be, this is to give you, we're going to give this to you tonight. You'll have a couple of weeks to look at it, and we'll vote on it. Uh, on, we'll discuss it and vote on it on March March 22nd. My contribution on that was one word. Okay. 
Get it? <laughs> I knew that Greg had done a lot of work on it. I didn't want to leave you out of it. Uh, and your word was? Legally. <laughs> Anyhow. Question whether it belonged there. The reason, the reason why, uh, the reason why the, this new interest in, in rules and regulations and enforcement policy, we're going through a, po a personnel policy handbook, but we're not going through a town policy handbook. Um, then there's a distinction. And a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, a, the uh, proprietor of a local establishment come to visit us and let us know that he was um, concerned about uh, punishment for um, some violations of uh, the uh, having a liquor license. And uh, he let us know that there were five charges that we had, uh, we had asked for five days based upon events that happened over a two-year period on five different occasions, and that it had all been reduced to one measly little day, and he came in to talk about um, his treatment on, the, uh, on behalf of his establishment, and when that day was to be, um, to be when that punishment was to be exacted, and we, we compromised somewhat that night. I, it, I thought about that meeting for a while. I went back to the... Um, to the opinion written by the, the decision written by the uh, the alcohol control board, and we frankly um, we didn't do our job. We did not have policies and procedures in place that we could say that we were following in order to uh, punish someone, and that's on us. That's on the administration. It's on the board of, of, of selectmen. We followed the advice of law enforcement of our chief law enforcement officer who reported to us on these five events over a period of time. And um, he recommended that, that we suspend the license for a period of time. He would not commit to a period of time, but he recommended that we do it. And we thought that five days was, was legitimate. Um, I still think they may have been legitimate, but it doesn't make any difference because they, they were reduced to one. Um, we have to do a better job in the future if we're going to take our job of giving licenses for alcoholic beverage sales seriously. And so this is the first step there to um, come up with, to uh, agree on rules and regulations and enforcement policy. The gentleman asked two questions that night that he wanted answers on the record for. Um, it appeared that he had watched our meeting in which we, uh, very closely, the meeting in which we announced the, um, the penalty. And if he had recalled the meeting that he, that he watched, he would have known the, the answer to one of those questions. He wanted to know two things. He wanted to know who it was that recommended that we, we use the Saturday night on St. Patrick's Day weekend to punish his, his establishment. And um, I'm happy to, to, to announce for the record, again, that it was uh, Mr. Lynham that recommended that, and we all supported that recommendation. Uh, the second thing that he wanted to know was how much it cost the town in legal services for, the, for that whole operation. And because he told us that it cost him $25,000 to, to, to fight it. Well, it cost the town $25,586.82 to bring this matter to, the, uh, to, a, to an end. Um, it's a lot of money. And hopefully it's a lot of money that, um, uh, that we can, it's money that we can reduce uh, in the future if we start doing our job the way it ought to be done. I don't mean to, to belabor the point, but I, I think we need to, to get better. And I think looking at this policy is the, um, or starting to look at this policy is the, the best way forward. Yes? I'd like to make a, a comment. Once we go over this policy and once we vote it and adopt it, I think it would be well deserved that each establishment, when they're come to get their next license, that they handed one, and they sign it, and you can say, they may not agree with it, but they can sign stating that they did receive the policy. Actually, once the board adopts the policy, a copy will be sent to each alcohol Right. License. And we should, get, we should get a signed copy back. I would that, think that a might be copy, That yeah. might even be something that goes in the policy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'd be good. That'd be that's great. what I used to do with my... There's something in there. Well, great, thing. Yeah. Thank you very right. much. And hopefully, hopefully it will be easier for um, uh, law enforcement to do the job that they need to do also. Um, the fact of the matter is that the police and fire were called on at least five separate occasions over the last two years to that particular establishment to take care of business. 
um, that's a lot of that's a lot of business. Uh, the the gentleman made it a point to say that that the, he thought that the police chief and the fire chief were fine fine young men, uh, and of course he knows them well because he's seen them a lot. Um, I, wow, <laughs> you know, but but at any rate. Um, I think we want to give our law enforcement people the, ch the chance to do their job the way yep. they can do it. I and I think this will be a step in the right direction. They've done a good job so far. They can, we, we can do, we can do, we all can do too much better. I just, uh, I'm sorry, but I got another message um, from someone you all know. This is from a person uh, by the name of Carol who says, you do have a second observer, your wife, who thanks you for keeping opiate overdose issues on the front burner. As you all know, Carol is the uh, area director for High Point Treatment Center in, in uh, Brockton. I probably should have disclosed that, you know, <laughs> sort of like every time Dan Shaughnessy writes something about the Red Sox, he says, remember that my boss is John Henry, who owns the Red Sox, that he owns the Globe. Well, so your boss is, so my boss is, is telling me, my boss is telling me, yeah, that's right. And she said she's a good boss. It's a good boss. <laughs> oh, boy. I like that. Yeah, that was fun. Um, presentation. <laughs> I like that, really. <laughs> presentation. Presentation of the fiscal year 15 audited financial statement, Frank. Yes. Uh, we have received uh, printed copies of our okay. fiscal 15 audited financial. Copies were provided to each selectman. Uh, the audited financial statement is now up on the website for anyone who may choose to look at it and the financial includes uh, data involving the financial health of the town the report is clean there's also a management letter associated with it that makes some recommendations uh, to improve our operations there are two recommendations I agree with and one I don't but we will follow through on those as well Thank you. Thank you. What did thank you. you say? No, I, I... You're in trouble. I'm going to, yeah. I did turn it off. <laughs> but I also have OCD, and when I see the little one there, you know, I, I have to get rid of it. Uh, I have to acknowledge it and get rid of it. And so I've been told that um, a brace of Tims are watching from the back, and so they're, uh, they're observing this meeting, too. So thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Chief Breno. This meeting is sliding into silliness. Okay. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> Review the annual town meeting warrant. Some right. of us are up for re -election. You've yes. given us the town meeting warrant tonight. This is a draft. Um, at present time, there are 54 articles. Uh, a surprising number of capital requests this year, I guess. <laughs> Not really surprising. Uh, we knew several of them were coming, but uh, the uh, significant, particularly significant ones are for the schools, for technology, uh, the uh, fire department fortunately has an ambulance revenue fund that will cover many of the chief's requests. The police department has a fine account that will cover some of their requests. And the rest of us are out there at the mercy of the general fund. Uh, there, there, are, there are some articles that um, will probably look at prioritizing once we have all of our revenue numbers. We are hoping uh, to allocate approximately $800,000 this year for capital needs. That sounds a lot until you realize that just the Whitman allocations for Whitman Hansen exceed 835000 So once again, we'll, we'll be working to prioritize and some people may be a little disappointed in the ultimate result. But one of the things I mentioned in a previous meeting is that this uh, opportunity to plan capital needs comes from 
the local uh, property assessments for personal property from National Grid. They added $73 million in equipment that has been added to our tax base. Uh, unlike real estate, that amortizes down each year. There's depletion and there's amortization that reduce that number. And our best guess is it'll be good for eight to 10 years on a declining basis. So what we're going to do is identify each year where those numbers sit and allocate that money for capital. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, we're, we're never not going to have substantial capital needs. So we're just trying to work it into the process. Another thing we're going to recommend this year is the meals tax is now producing approximately $140,000 a year. Our OPEB liability, just for health insurance, is over $13 million. And we have begun, uh, we've created an account to recognize our liability. And over the next few years, the Government Accounting Standards Board is going to place more emphasis on actually funding some of that liability. So uh, I will be meeting with the Finance Committee and I'm going to seek a recommendation from them and from the Board of Selectmen to, for the foreseeable future, commit <coughs> the meals tax to funding annually our OPEB liability. Uh, if there are any particular questions on articles, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, I have one, one suggestion, Frank, on whether it can work or not. Um, we do need to have capital needs on our school uh, buildings, the two elementary and the middle school. I know we're taking care of the Duval School. Um, the Article 50, uh, 53, that's to put into the regional system for schools, town yes. schools if we need it. If, in fact, we have any money left over, miracle if we may, if we were to add money in that, that way we may be able to play catch up because if we're only dealing with some of the issues of the schools, we may be able to put start stashing money away to take care of the other issues. Because I know well, there's a lot. Well, I, hopefully our intent will be to fund those projects that need to be funded immediately. The 800? Uh, I, frankly, I can't commit to 800,000 right. to the I'm schools saying, yeah. because if I do that, there's nothing left for the rest of the town. Exactly right. And That's there are other yeah. capital needs. So we're going to have to set up some type of priority. The capital committee met yep. with the schools last Thursday and reviewed their requests. Uh, we also have a couple of leftover requests from this year and last year. One of them Thanks. is they purchased a new heating, uh, water heating system for the high school. Uh, and we will have to pay our portion of that, uh, which will be in the special town meeting warrant. And uh, we also have a cost overrun on the hot water system for the middle school, which is something under $3,500. And that will also be in the special. But it's just a reminder, these, these things don't end. This Article 6 is the top priority. Well, Article 6 is a request to appropriate $335,000. 35 of it is intended to be uh, to pay an engineer, you know, designer, to get into the nuts and bolts of the problem with the Duval roof and come back with a report and a design plan to fix it. The 300000 is our best guess of what the cost is at this point. And that's not a whole roof. That's just replacing the new roof section. The Mass School Building Authority uh, funded the construction of that roof in 1999-2000. And you have to wait 20 years before you can seek additional money on the building. Our argument, however, was it was under their stewardship that this roof, which was poorly constructed, is failing, and we're asking for an exception to fund additional uh, money. 
And that's somewhere between 50 and 55% of the cost. If they do that, then we'll only spend half of that. Half of that, assuming the cost is right at 300000 If they don't, then we're going to recommend to the schools that we do whatever maintenance is necessary to protect the roof until 2020 when the clawback is done, and then we will go back and seek funding from MSBA. Hmm. Okay. Anyone else? I know the school committee is next door with the finance committee tonight. They are. I ran into Ruth Whitner yesterday at a meeting about the, um, the March 15th um, event, and um, she's going from, that group is going from here to visit the Hanson Selectman, I think, at, right afterwards. So I said, gee, I certainly am Double happy letter. that I have my own meeting to go to. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to, that, you know, that's like, that's taking a huge bullet for the cost, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, old business. <laughs> Time to continue the hearing with respect to the status of the Class Two auto dealer's license held by Diesel Trucks, David Federico, and the premises located at 575 Bedford Street. Back again. Good evening. I'm E. Pamela Salpoglu, and I represent David Federico doing business as Diesel Trucks. Do you have the card? I do. I'll repeat that. E. Pamela Salpagolo? Close enough. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Salpagolo. Okay. Thank you. And basically, we're, we're back here today because David was going to get some things done. Yes. At his, uh, at his uh, place of business, uh, part of what uh, you were holding, something that looked like it might be a site plan. It is, and I have. And we were going to get a recommendation also from uh, the, the Commissioner uh, Curran tonight. So it's my understanding, and I wasn't privy to the, the prior hearings that were held, but there were some issues that were outstanding from the December 2015 letter. The first being handicapped and customer parking. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, to the mid right hand side of the site plan, there is an office and my client has designated three customer parking spots in the front of the office. There is a handicap spot spot four and above handicap spot four is spot 47 and it's my understanding that the building commissioner has requested uh, an additional larger spot for the handicap spot so handicap spot four would encompass spot four and 47 so I believe that concern has been addressed the other issues that remained was the space to turn around now my client has reconfigured the lot and you can see to the left of the office and the customer parking spot there's a 57 foot turnaround spot also 48 goes the um, the distance in the the lateral so there's plenty of spot now to turn around and the egress the driveway is 20 feet wide based upon this site plan so I believe that Mr. Curran uh, should be fine with the, the proposed turnaround space. Um, there was an issue also raised about many vehicles not being operable. 
my client has removed a significant portion of those vehicles from the lot um, and he's incurred costs for that. He has mm -hmm. uh, put them on storage lots and he's paying for that. So that concern has been addressed to my understanding. Um, the last was some debris being left on the lot. Uh, and I can represent that I went to the lot today before coming here and the lot looks a lot better. Um, so the only issue that remains is the number of spots mm -hmm. that are um, sought to be on the license. Initially when my client received the license back in 2009 there was no car limit listed on the license for the class 2 dealership. Now in 2015 that was amended on the license and it was reflected to show 52 spots um, and it's my understanding now that Mr. Curran has come up from the 35 spot recommendation up to 40. However, my client would be looking um, to maintain the 52 or as a compromise go down to 48 spots and um, right now the lot itself is 20,520 square feet. Uh, each parking spot theoretically would take about 200 square feet. So theoretically we have spots for 100 vehicles. Give or take some square footage, um, that would be 90 is what we, you know, we could theoretically fit here. But my client's looking to maintain the 52. As you can see from this site plan, there are 62 vehicles. Um, subtracting the 147 spot from the handicapped brings us down to 62. So I don't think my client's request that we maintain the status quo of 52 is unreasonable given the nature of this site plan. Can I ask a question? You, you said you base these spaces at 200? 200 square 10 feet. By 10, 10 by 20. Okay. And that's uh, industry standard for an average car? For an average car. Okay. And what is, how many trucks, trucks do you have compared to cars and ratio on that? Oh, I'd say probably 50% cars. And so what would the industry standard average size space cars, be for a truck? Cars probably smaller actually. Cars probably 17 feet. I mean a truck I would think 20, maybe be more than fair. Um, he has a box truck right now. It's about 10 feet long by 20. Well, it's a 10 foot size box. So, and that's, that's a larger size feet. vehicle. And that fits in a 10 by 20 that space? fits in a 10 by 20, yeah. As long as you don't have to open the door. I do open my truck. Yeah. Yeah. It's not parking. Mm -hmm. And no. just a, and either of the Tims in back seen this plan by any chance? Okay, Bob, do you want to chime in? Do you have a recommendation to make? I do. It looks like a lot of progress has been made since the first meeting. Uh, yes, I, I have been out there four, four or five times since we started trying to eliminate some of the vehicles. On um, the 29th of February, there was 47 cars. On the 1st of March, there was 40 cars. And again, today I was there at 10 past 10 this morning, and there was 40 vehicles. Um, this plan is not to scale. Uh, if you look at what's there on the, the lot, there's some vehicles that will take up three or four of these spaces. Um, this plan shows 57 feet for turnaround but it's also taken into account where customers may be parking. So if there's three cars parked in the customer parking, then that turnaround space kind of gets eliminated. The entry should be a double car width, should be at least 24 feet wide. And then once you fill up customer parking and you have 24 feet as access, so you can get a car in and a car coming out. Mm -hmm. This is a really busy section of Route 18. If there's one car pulling in, another one pulling out, one may have to back out onto the, the roadway, and that concerns me. Um, there's vehicles in what looks, what appears to be the woods in the back. There's one um, flatbed that's got another truck on it, and I didn't count the truck on top of the flatbed as one of the vehicles. So there's actually 41 if you want to look at it that way. M my feeling is, is that if this board would like to entertain to up the limit of the number of vehicles, then a scaled 
plans should be submitted. Something done by a land surveyor that does site plans all the time. Um, these look pretty good when you look at these numbers, but it's also difficult to get back to the car that's three back. There's some of them are, are larger trucks that um, you can't even move around because they, they had flat tires. He's got most of them fixed, but he's still got other vehicles missing parts. It looks more like a junkyard in some of some of the areas or some of the parts of the slot. The issue here is that I think that the uh, Mr. Frederico wants to protect the fact that he has a, a large, fairly large number for his license, and he wants to start selling uh, cars. He wants to go for the cars that are fifteen thousand dollars, but that's not happening yet. Right now, there's a lot of vehicles that, in my opinion, are going to be difficult for him to sell. But I'm not in the business. Um, I, my feeling right now is that you should keep it at forty. Um, until maybe the inventory turns around a little bit and he starts to um, sell more vehicles and make the um, lot itself look a lot more attractive. Okay, anyone have any questions? Yes. Okay, first of all, Mr. Frederick, I've been very tough on you, and I have to say you're, it's 100% improvement. Okay, I've been by it a number of times in and out. Uh, but I do have to say is this plot plan is too clean. It doesn't represent your, your 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 land. The back lot, where all these cars, where you get from 53 to 62, is all woods. Well, there and are cutting there leaves are, and, well, and there things. are cars there. Right. Yeah. If I want to buy if I want to buy a car that's in spot 53, I got to move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars to get it out. Come on. I mean, this plot plan. You're trying to fit as many cars as you can get on this lot, and I understand that in a business point of view, but the fact is your lot as it stands today with the 40 vehicles looks clean, but the back of the lot, if you look at it, is still congested because they're packed in the woods. Um, it's not as clean as what you show right here to put this amount of cars. Well, that, that plan there has 62 cars on it, so if, if we're going to take 10 cars right, right off the top, so you, you, there'll be another 10 spots off of this plan for also for turnaround room so if the back seven or eight vehicles are a problem we can delete those seven or eight vehicles off the plan okay and, and then you're looking at and then we you know we're bet right down to that 52 number right and then you're looking at then you're looking at uh, spots 21 back to 13 that are in the well actually to 16 that are in the middle of two other vehicles you can't move the one on the left towards the house because you're going to go in that person's land, so I mean, you got to move four cars to get at one, and the way they're so tight, looking at this plot plan, can you actually get around and look at what you want to buy? I mean, may, well, may I address that? Uh, may I address that? Go ahead. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the way that most dealerships are configured is that they are set up in rows, and when, uh, and, and I think we need to address. Um, a, a larger problem too with the customer parking. I mean, uh, and I heard Mr. Curran say that you know that there are three parking spots, but this is not Dunkin' Donuts. This is a used car dealership. Uh, Mr. Federico gets two customers per day if he's lucky, uh, and that's on a good day. There's never a high traffic volume. People call, they make an appointment. He gets the car out of the spot and has it ready. To, to show to a customer. So it's not the customer that's going to be moving the car, it would be Mr. Federico, and he would have ample notice to have that car removed. He's certainly not going to interfere with his abutters. He has a good relationship, no one is, is here today. Um, with reference to the back of the lot, the, those vehicles there can be, I, I would not seek to remove those vehicles uh, in, in that storage area. Mr. Federico does get trade-in vehicles from customers. Trade-in vehicles tend to not be always ready, showroom ready or available for sale, and those should be placed in the back of the lot. They are not frontline desirable cars at the, the time, and they can go to auction or to wholesale at that point. But the way we have it structured here, um, we do have 60 spots available. Um, and Mr. Federico is just looking to maintain 52 cars. As Mr. Curran said, Mr. Federico's business plan is to start eliminating the lower value vehicles. He'd like to get into a higher 
value vehicle. However, he's going to need those additional spots to get those new cars on the lot and then slowly sell off the vehicles that he has. Anyone else? I'd like to know what uh, two chiefs think about it after looking at this, if they had any issues or concerns. I would, I would just be concerned with the 20-foot deepness on the way in. If we had an issue over the back garages or buildings, which we have in the past, um, I would be concerned that if somebody comes in with a box truck and parks, um, they're not supposed to park or whatever, or if, uh, if uh, a customer we would have a tough time of coming kind of fit through. My recommendation would be 24 to 36 inches uh, uh, feet of like an opening there, like they normally do. Okay. Okay. So we pretty feet. much eliminate like maybe 41 to 46 and 31 to 32 to like open that up and then we have a check it out. So, that, so. That, that, and, and he does not have a, uh, a problem eliminating spots 41 through 46 uh, and 31 then. So that would be a total of seven spots from the 60, would still put us at 53. And he, you know, he's looking to just maintain the status quo at 52. Okay, anybody else? I so is it is it is it mainly cars or is it a combination of cars and trucks? Combination of both, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mr. Curran, when you look at the combination of the trucks and the cars, um, this plot plan is mainly referencing cars. Is, is it is it taking into consideration the trucks in yeah, between? Like we're what area do you have designated for the trucks and for the cars, or are they just going to be kind of intermingled? They're just everywhere. And so, so, so you have a, a passenger car, which is you said about 17 feet. 17 next, feet could be next to a, a, a pickup, 20 yeah. foot box pickup. truck there. Yeah, so, you don't have too many box trucks. I only have two, so it's it's not like a large percentage of the inventory is commercial vehicles either. They're just regular size pickups. Oh, so they're, they're pickup yeah. trucks. So yeah, okay, they're pickups, so they're not yeah. like a commercial vehicle. They're not too like, okay, so they're I do pickup have a truck. truck there that okay. I'm trying to sell that has 82,000 miles that I thought I could you know sell and but you know there's probably only two trucks or three trucks on that lot that are over 20 feet and, and I got a 10 foot distance on the width so your average car is six feet wide. So if you have two cars, they're 12 feet wide, you have about four feet in between both the vehicles to easily open the doors on both sides. You know, your average width on a vehicle is six feet, so I'm, I got a 10 foot width on each one. So I got ten, two feet on this side and two feet on the other. And there's plenty of room to open doors and get in. And I can't see like it I said, it's 20,000 square feet. We're talking about a half acre of land over there, I mean. It's, it's a big lot. It does look very small when you drive by. There's only a 110 feet of frontage. It doesn't have 190 feet of frontage. It has 110 feet of frontage, but it also goes back 183 feet on the right side and the left side's, you know, approximately somewhere in the 150 feet deep side, you know. It's 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 a it's a lot. It's a it's a big size lot. Anyone else have any any further questions, or, and, or could I have a motion? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. What was Bob's recommendation? I think ultimately, I, um, my recommendation right now would be keep it at forty for six months, and then do reevaluate at that point. Um, the other part of my recommendation would be to have absolutely no storage of unoperable or disabled vehicles uh, for more than. A, a reasonable amount of time. Right now, my guess is that 30 to 40 percent of them are not operable or sellable. Just based on what I've seen there, there's still vehicles with flat tires. So if you can't move them, it's not going to do anybody much good. So uh, again, my recommendation be six months at 40 vehicles and then reevaluate at the end of that, depending on how the lot looks. And, and you'd like to see a uh, plot plan that's. Uh to scale. scale. Uh, I mean, to look at this plan the way it is, you can't tell the actual size of the spaces. 
if you have it that's two scale, it gives a little bit more reason. Um, I think the fire chief's recommendation of eliminating the vehicles that the Mr. Federico is, is willing to get rid of to make the entrance about 30 feet. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a that's a great start. Right now, it's too narrow. And if you count the customer parking, and they have one or two customers there, now keep in mind this is diesel trucks. Somebody that's going to enter the site to look at a vehicle could very well be in a diesel truck that's a flatbed or something else that wants to move it off the site, and they, they may come in with a flatbed and need time, need space to maneuver. There, are the garages that are in the back left-hand side of your, the top left side of your plan, those, um, if there is a fire or if somebody needs to get emergency access, that's the only way to get to those. But at 40, that's still that's a significant percentage of my client's lot. And if we eliminate spots 41, 46, and 30, 31, that ha would satisfy the, the commissioner. It also pl puts us still at 53 spots. Um, so I would then recommend encounter at 48. We can revisit this in six months. Um, but my client also disputes that approximately 30 to 40 percent of the cars are inoperable. That's just not the case. And there, there's also, and, and get, tell me if I'm wrong, isn't there trees back here where these are all parked? Uh, there's some grass and I think there's full-grown mature trees. At the very back line. Not, not, not in between not, the, not the, cars. In the, of the cars. Right, no. no. But they're all kind of skewed in there. Part of what our bylaws say is that you have to have sufficient, you have to have adequate surface or, or a suitable surface for a parking space. It doesn't, and commercially it wants to have pavement. Um, it does give conditions for, for one and two family dwellings to have gravel, but I mean, we haven't, we haven't even addressed that. So he needs to do a lot of cleanup there. Again, my recommendation would be 40 cars, and if he cleans it up and actually satisfies um, some of my requests as far as neating up the back of the lot, perhaps we could consider it sooner than this, than six months. But I think for right now, the number of vehicles that stand there now are, are um, I have a question for Bob. Appropriate. Are you going to eliminate those spots? Bob, is this mm -hmm. house a, a residential dwelling? Yes. And what's behind it back here? Um, it's just unoccupied. Back but is it residential zone or is this all commercial um, zone? It's highway business to mm -hmm. about, I think and it's about 20 feet back behind okay. that line. So there's no buffer that has to be set up between he can go right up to this lot line and right up to this lot line? Yes, and again, this is all grandfathered stuff. This never went to the Board of Appeals for specifically for uh, a car dealer. I think what originally it was Crossroads. Um, yeah. They originally right. owned over there. Then Crossroads moved across the street when the whole building got built. And there never was a limit, but there were never... This is a unique use. This is trucks. This is something that we don't have a lot of sale, um, class two auto dealers for, for the sale of trucks. And because of that, it takes up, some of these vehicles take up more than one and a half to two spaces. Was this Standish way back when? Was this all part of Standish? Standish? I think it might have been. I think this was all Standish Motors back in the 80s, and they had this entire yeah. parcel and then separated it when they yeah, split yeah, Dan, Dan yeah, Bob, I have a question. Correct me if I'm wrong. There are used car licenses, and there are salvage licenses, right? Correct. Classify a salvage license is selling vehicles that do not run, that are strictly for parts. Right, and if if he were going to run an operation like that, he would need to go to the zoning board of appeals for at least a special permit and probably likely a variance. Right, and you're saying that the back end of the woods, the 53 to 62 lots that he has there, um, flat tires inoperable, they can't be driven. Um, I and I don't know that because I haven't asked him to start them. I think that if you just use the language that the, the vehicles have to be, um, they can't be inoperable and you can't store junk. I think if you use that language, that works. And inoperable vehicles might be, if they get a trade-in or he buys a vehicle that is inoperable, he brings it in on a flatbed or a tow truck, he should have a reasonable amount of time to get that but, in service. Right, but you can look at those vehicles in the back and tell well, if they've just those. come in or if they've been there for six months. They, they've been there a long time. Uh, and uh, yes, sure I know. I've looked at them. That's why I know what I'm asking a question. I already know the answer. Okay. And in the back in the woods, it's salvage as far as I'm concerned. There's a pickup truck with a transmission sitting in the bed. Yeah. There's yeah. There's a lot of vehicles that need a lot of work. And those aren't saleable. Well, saleable 
they may be saleable parts, but not saleable cars as far as I'm concerned. That being said, I mean, you're taking up spots that are dead, dead vehicles when you could have 40 vehicles that can be driven off the lot for somebody to buy. So why would you take up space for saleable vehicles with stuff like that? Unless you're selling parts and you don't have a license for that. But he's not selling parts and he's taking cars in trade and he's also getting cars at the auction that may need some work. And there, he, there's no requirement that I'm aware of that would preclude him from purchasing those vehicles. Okay. That and being said, you got eight, you got eight spots back there and you say you're selling two cars a month, you said, or whatever? Well, the last, the last couple of months I've been just moving cars to storage locations and trying to find storage locations. I haven't even been open for the last 60 days. Well, well, I've been doing what I'm saying is, money. you're saying is, if you bring in it, if you bring, you're selling a couple of cars a month, you got eight months. You got eight months of vehicles stored in the back there of trading. I no, told, I told you from the beginning, it's not an easy business. It's not a glamorous Understandable. business. Understandable. But a, I, a I would like work. you to That's talk straightforward. I have been. No, you haven't. Not when you come in with something like and this. That's, and that plan is to scale. It doesn't have the scaling on it because I had it printed. That plan is to scale. So you can you put know, cards it, around the house. I don't have any cards behind the house. Well, then why do you have it? That there, for your have, lot. There's no cost behind the house. The, the lot's the a separate lot, lot here with 60 feet of frontage and it goes all the way back to the side. There are no, there's, and there's, I'm renting this whole right side of the property. And it does designate the car you lot space from the lot size. There, there's a 7,000 square foot difference. Uh, I, and again, I, I just feel that it would cause my client irreparable harm to reduce the number so significantly. Um, we are conceding right now we could give, we could, uh, we, we have 60 spots here. We can concede 41 through 31. I believe my client would even be willing to concede uh, some additional spots to bring it down to 48. Um, the handicap parking, um, we discussed that. That requires an unloading area. Mm -hmm. um, so number 47. Well, for, the handicap spot four, yeah, and he's mm -hmm. giving up 47. Yeah, well, 50 can't be there either. You need to have, the, the unloading area has to be. But th that would be adjacent four to 47. So there could be a car there. There would be, there would be nothing to prevent a handicapped party from opening the door into, lot, into space 47. You have to have the van. Yeah. It has to be van access. It, it, and there is plenty of spots. It's two, that, two that spots. That needs to be eight feet wide. Yeah, so that's more than that's eight feet wide. That's two spots that he's conceding mm. there. So I, I, I would respectfully request that we keep it at 52. If the, if the board is, you know, going to um, heed Mr. Curran's good counsel at 40, I, I'd say my client would concede and go down to 48. But to take it down to 40 is, is just going to cause him irreparable harm. He's already spending enormous amounts of money storing other vehicles at lots. To get these vehicles off of his lot would cost him additional sums of money. It's, it's just patently unreasonable for him to lose such a percentage. How many vehicles are on the lot right now? 40. 40. There are 40 now. Well, if you count the one on top of the flatbed, is 41. Okay. <laughs> And there's still plenty of, of room. You can see where there are no you can spots. The path and there's tons of room. When I was there today, the lot looks a lot better. It isn't laid out. These vehicles aren't stored as this layout shows. If they were to store it as this layout shows, it may change my mind. Yeah. But right now, it's still there's cars out in the middle of the aisle, mm -hmm. or there's one car out in the middle of the aisle, and you can't maneuver very easily. It's a whole lot easier than it was. If you increase this to 52, all the cars that he just got rid of are coming back. And that's a problem because we're going to be right back where we started. If he follows this layout, if you want to make, I make a recommendation that we get a, a plot plan or a site plan that is to scale and done by a registered land surveyor, then we can readdress this and you can put this on hold for a little while. What about the surface that's in the back woods? That has to be, I think can't be know, leaves and trees. I think we should know what's there. Show yeah. the trees. Show what's there. I know what's there. It's leaves and gravel and branches. And, and if it stops, so he's not supposed to park on that. So we, we could go by just the par description of the parking in the zoning bylaw. So, and if he wants to start to prepare this and make everything more suitable than it is right now, then this board should consider to raise the number of vehicles. Okay. But right now, the way it is, is a whole lot more safer than it was. Okay, I get it. Um, Scott, did you want to say something? No, I, I, I mean, I think just to move it along, I'd like to make a motion. And it sounds like 
and he's certainly been here as much as the rest of us. The gentleman is trying um, to make some improvements out there, and slowly but surely we're getting there. Um, but I, I would make a motion that um, we allow up to 45 cars. That he follows the recommendations of Bob as far as the customer parking, the handicap parking, follows the recommendations of the fire chief, and have at least 28 feet? 28 to 30 feet. 28 to 30 feet access. He comes back in here with a plan stamped by a registered landscape architect showing everything to scale, showing what's in the back here, and at that time we can address whether we're going to allow any to go from 45 up to up to whatever his original license was. You can go back up to okay. whatever you know we whatever think we can fit. The parcel can hold. Is there whatever a second? The parcel can hold within reason. But Is there yeah. a second for that? A second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Good. Well, I mean, does that seem I like a reasonable compromise to you? Or? I, I think that for now it is, and, and if there's an issue that I have, I will address it. Okay. okay. Right. Bob Ocasey? Okay, and so is there a time period in your motion? I think they? it remains at 45 until they come in with a plan. Yeah, until he's come back with his plan and you Give him Bob some time to, to, to come up with the money or, or land surveyor that will help. Yeah, we don't want to put it out of business, but... You know, we, we feel we that that's reasonable, and, and we would agree to that. Let's give it... How much time do you need? Two, six months. Yeah, six months. Six months. Okay. There we go. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Or any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? I'll say yes. Aye. Aye. Thanks. Those opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Frank, do you want to talk about a dog park? Yes. Uh, as you may have noted, one of the articles on the annual town meeting is a request for funding for Dog Park. Uh, we have discussed this previously. We're going to be, assuming we move forward with that, seeking uh, grant funds from the Stanton Foundation to make that happen. But one of the key elements that we had mentioned, and I just want to get it out there, is that if we're going to adopt or, or accept the concept of a dog park, then we also need to have public support to operate that park. In order for it to be uh, feasible and, and appropriate, we're going to need a citizen committee to actually adopt the process, to, to participate in the design and setup of the park, and to manage it. And the citizen committee would be responsible for managing the facility, uh, ensuring the rules and regulations that are adopted are followed, and providing cleanup of the park uh, periodically through uh, appropriately placed uh, disposal containers that can be cleared out regularly. It, it would not be uh, the desire or the intent of the DPW to manage this process. So this would be very typical for what other community dog parks are, user managed. So I'm encouraging, if this is going to happen, we need the support of the public, and I'm encouraging people to contact our office to express their interest in being a part of this process. Great, thank you. Anybody else around the board? Frank, do you have anything you want to add to beyond agenda items? I do not. Okay, Scott? No. Nope. Nothing. Nothing? One small tidbit. I just want to thank all those uh, retired workers at the uh, election primary on March 1st. That was a long day for them. And most of those folks are uh, much older than me. And they they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they looked pretty tired. Uh, I know that I came in to get some results 
around 10:30, and they were still working hard there. So, from six in the morning till probably 11 at night, they uh, they deserve a big thank you, even though they're getting paid. But you know, some people here were 90 years old, so they certainly deserve our thanks. Okay, thank you for recognizing that. And I have uh, I have nothing to add to the proceedings. Laurie reminds me that I received something in the mail the other day that I did uh, intend to present to the board. Uh, we have discussed in the past public support for education and the Stanton Foundation. Uh, we've received a request from the Stanton Foundation to join other communities in a resolution to support the recommendations of the Mass Foundation Budget Review Commission uh, as it relates to supporting uh, the funding that's necessary to address the costs associated with health care and special education that affect each and every budget. Uh, it does involve a resolution, so what I'd like to do is bring this forward at our next meeting rather than introduce Thank it you. now. That would be a good idea, yeah. So can, we can look at something. Okay, anybody Anybody file? else? Pardon? Put it in the read file. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I, it would be good to have it on the agenda, I think. Uh, Important enough. Yes, even though the read file is acknowledged every, every week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I, th I think we may, might be done. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are out of here. Thank you.